whistleblowers don't get believed for like a while? It's a great question. I feel like it's gotten worse in recent years because um, everyone kind of attacks the whistleblower. It takes a lot of courage. I mean, the whistleblowers now are more nervous about coming forward because, you know, for example, if they have everything to lose, oftentimes not just their job, but their safety and things. So they have to weigh is it worth me coming forward and potentially ruining my life or should I just keep my mouth shut and let a wrong happen? I think in this case, it's a great example of whistleblowers kind of defying the odds and kind of sticking with it. And, you know, their stubbornness is so inspiring, I think, because they just refused to give up. So, you know, I wish more whistleblowers would come forward. I wish more journalists had relationships with whistleblowers where everyone could kind of trust each other. And I hope that this story, you know, leads to more of that because it's it, in order for democracy to work, I think we really need more kind of conversations like that. Well, as a journalist, don't you need, it's a burden of proof is on these whistleblowers to yeah. get you as much proof because like they could have some proof, a lot of proof, and sometimes it's even not enough. Well, I had the best whistleblowers ever. I mean, they had all the receipts, you know, all the paperwork and the emails. And so it really just took kind of a partnership for me to really trust the material they were providing me, to be really diligent, obviously, and for them to be very transparent and forthcoming with me. And so I think we worked really well together. Um, you know, it was a very complicated case because you had several people who were totally in cahoots with each other and very few others knew what was going on. So we had to, like, make sure we had everything buttoned up. But... Um, you know, at the end of the day, the the way they kind of fought to keep it, you know, in the mix and the way I was able to get, get my part of it done and then all the investigators, the way they came in, I think finally justice was served. Right, right, right. And um, how many years did Eric end up serving? Well, he's, I think he's totally going to spend 27 years. So it's, he, he was, I think, initially sentenced to 10 or 15. And then when he escaped, they added on a lot more. The judge more. added on more, right. Yeah, right. exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah. How come when it... A con against the government kind of gets overlooked more when it's against a company or a person. Uh, um, yeah, that's a great question, you know, because the victim in these cases sometimes can be hard to find. In this case, actually, there's a lot of victims, so which makes it really disturbing. But sometimes when the taxpayer is the victim, um, you know, the public feels a little, you know, less passionate about it because they feel like, oh, it's just taxpayer money, whatever. But in this case, there's obviously a real tragedy, um, and it's like obviously heartbreaking. And so I think that made the government feel a lot more intense about getting this thing finished. Now that there's a series about this, do you think now Eric's name's going to be up there with Abagnale and Ponzi? I mean, it's amazing that he always saw himself as a movie star and a James Bond type figure. And then here he is, you know, there's this big kind of Hollywood premiere and he can't be part of it. I'm sure that's kind of eating at him. But, um, you know, in a way, he, guys, he always wanted to have this day, but not under these circumstances. So I think in... For, as far as the government's concerned, he will be one of the most infamous fraudsters of all time.